in crypto. Um, the, the point of this talk is to share some things that, I, that I've found or that I've learned or share with me that I, that I thought were very neat and useful. Um, these are really common things that are that are common mistakes in cryptography, common implementation mistakes that I think you'll uh, also find if you look at a lot of things, um, some things. And, uh, and if you've been watching the news, you've probably noticed, I guess not the news, the internet, that cryptography is moving really fast. Like every, I'm always getting links, I always have tabs open, there's too many things I can keep up with about uh, different attacks, the NSA is backdooring this, uh, there's a bug in PayPal's this, and it's all crypto stuff. It's, things are moving really fast, I think we're getting to the point where people are um, really discovering a lot of this, it's been kind of late, people have been sitting on it for years, Nobody's looked into it. People are kind of uh, learning about all these things. There's a new attack on SSL all the time. Um, there's just a lot of stuff that's moving really fast. So I think this is very, very interesting stuff and, and also timely. Uh, so my goal for this talk is that when you see random numbers like this, random things like this, that you actually can have an idea of what uh, you know, what, what possibly might be going on there. Uh, but, you know, but before you have knowledge of cryptography, you might think that's just random stuff. I can do nothing with it. Go on, move on to typing something else. I'm going to go find process scripting or something. But now, uh, hopefully after you've seen this talk, if that means nothing to you, hopefully you look at that thing, follow and look for patterns and try to understand the mistakes that developers might have made uh, when implementing this. So, I was a little challenged, going back to that previous slide, to understand the audience and who we have here. Um, hey, Alex. <laughs> Looking at this slide, we're all going to be this shot, all right? So, uh, we do have a tradition here. The first time that you get up and give a talk, you get a shot, even if you are the family godfather. So, uh, all right, everybody ready? Shot, 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 shot. So I was a little challenged to understand the audience. Um, I'm just kind of curious. I didn't know what uh, what really to target this talk for. So I'm just kind of curious. Um, have you guys heard, familiar with? Uh, raise your hand if you're familiar with some of these uh, terms up here, some of these attacks. Okay, besides SSL, obviously, we don't know that. Um, and uh, how about? Do you get, are there any developers in the audience that actually write code, or I guess pen testers that write code that actually implement crypto? Thanks to the Lion Security. All right, one. And uh, <laughs> and, and how many of you in the audience, raise your hand if you review systems that implement crypto, if you're an uh, independent um, application security or security manager or something like that? That, how many of you are uh, responsible for cryptography? I mean, not responsible for cryptography, but responsible for, for security of, uh, of, of programs. All right, a little number. So, one thing, uh, if, if you've never heard of these terms, just to kind of set the expectations, I'm, I'm gonna try to cover them at a, at a kind of high level and keep everybody uh, interested in these. But uh, if, you know, if, you, if you haven't heard of these, you will hopefully gain a cursory understanding of these, but uh, hopefully learn enough to go back and uh, be able to learn more. Um, and also, hopefully, if you're familiar with all these terms, hopefully I don't bore you to death, because I've tried to kind of break these into uh, kind of easy, medium, and hard, the easy, ECB uh, being the easiest, and the SSL kind of being the hardest, I guess. Um, and uh, so as we go through them, hopefully, uh, I don't lose you, but the um, and we'll kind of reset three times at three separate attacks. So, uh, also, if you think you have any, if you have any questions, uh, especially any questions that other people might be having, feel free to ask at any time, uh, and feel free to uh, interrupt or uh, add any additional thoughts if you have any uh, additional to what I have said. Oops, one um, button. All right, so high level glossary stuff, terms I'll be using a lot. Uh, plain text is 
just the original data. Uh, it's unencrypted, unencrypted information. Ciphertext is the encrypted information. It's you know it's group user represented, represented by random hexadecimal. That kind of means nothing at that point. Um, no plain text. If I say that, that means we actually know what's going into the into the data. So. Um, if you just intercept random messages, it's not no plain text. If you're actually producing those messages, like if you're using it's being encrypted, that's no plain text. So uh, that actually kind of provides a lot of value and makes uh, a lot more attacks possible, maybe maybe five times as many attacks possible. That's totally rough estimate. <laughs> XOR is a uh, kind of a binary operation. If you aren't familiar with XOR, you can kind of think of it as a reversible addition. Um, that's a really basic definition, but if you aren't, I don't want to go into the details of XOR. If you aren't familiar with it, you don't want to lose you if you, if you aren't. So. Uh, so another thing is block, cipher, block ciphers or string ciphers. First we'll be talking about block ciphers, and second we'll be talking about string ciphers. Uh, so block ciphers operate on chunks of data. So if you have a value like set KC that you want to encrypt the block cipher, it's actually going to be padded out to eight bytes, uh, or actually any number of bytes that, that the block's had at. So usually a lot of times it's eight or 16, sometimes 32. And it'll, it'll be padded out uh, and encrypted eight bytes at a time. So you, you have to basically input a certain number of bytes into a block cipher. String ciphers operate one byte at a time. Uh, so if you were encrypting the value set KC, you would just kind of encrypt, if you encrypt S only for SE, uh, and it just, it, it's uh, kind of one byte at a time, that's why it's a, a string. It's kind of interesting the way they work, they just generate a simple key string of material and it XORs it to produce the ciphertext. Um, we'll kind of use this information later, that's why I mentioned to see it now. Um, you can see on the uh, set KC there, it's padded out. That's uh, also a um, something to know with a lot of cryptographic flaws. We won't get into those. The uh, padding or flaws. So the first thing, uh, as I said in the agenda, was uh, ECB mode. So uh, comments. There's this, this, these are from Wikipedia. The comment. Block cipher modes, there are okay, six of them there. Um, ECB is the first one we're going to talk about. There's uh, I mean, there's right, five others there. Uh, CBC is a very common also. Um, it's ECB's com is very simple to implement, but there's common mistakes when implementing it. So you see it a lot because it's easy, and you see it screwed up a lot because it's easy to make mistakes. Uh, ECB is the default in many languages. I, I think it is in Java, uh, not .NET. Uh, you, can, you can look at the language to see. Most people just you know, Google how to encrypt, encrypt their data, click on the first link, copy and paste, and then they, uh, you know, they, they don't have a good understanding of what, uh, what they're actually doing. So you see ECB, ECB mode a lot, even when they shouldn't be using it. So with ECB mode, you're, you're just operating one block at a time and encrypting that. Then you move on to the next block and you completely forget about what you just did and encrypt that again. So if you have the exact same input, you're going to get the exact same output out. So, uh, and that's a, presents a lot of vulnerability. Uh, there's, there's a lot of things you can do with that. So hopefully you guys can see that. If you encrypt a value, I think I have like 100 A's there, I'm not sure how many, then you get uh, a bunch of blocks with the exact same output. The, as you can see, all the blocks for the last one, there's probably an end of file or an inline or something like that that's, that's uh, messing up that last encrypted value. Once you encrypt all those, you get uh, a bunch of repeated blocks. So uh, all those A's encrypt and they be become the same thing over and over and over. So this is fine in some scenarios, but, but, but not in others. And it's important to understand when it's uh, when it's okay and when it's not. Uh, if you if you don't have a good understanding, I guess it's probably not a good thing to be to be implementing. So going uh, to the next slide, we, we threw in a couple B's in that uh, plain text there, and it and it messed up one block of the ciphertext. So you can see how one 
little difference will we'll, we'll completely mess up a block, but all the rest are the same. So exact same input equals the exact same output. You change one little bit, it's going to be completely different. With CBC mode, uh, the same input doesn't equal the same output. Each block is chained together, so each block relies on the block before it, and you encrypt uh, and in that order. So it, any changes will, uh, any everything you encrypt will affect the, everything, every value after it. So here we have encrypt all A's. We see no pattern that presents uh, more of a challenge to all of us in trying to break. And we throw in a couple B's here, and we get uh, a bunch of randomness as well. It really doesn't present a pattern. We don't see a pattern, so it's uh, uh, just at a grocery level, it's, it's, it's not providing any value to us as, a, as an attackers. All right, so here we're going to take, this is a very common example of DCB mode. I think this is kind of the, um, one of the most basic uh, kind of attacks, and it's, it's pretty cool. Um, so if we encrypt each, as, as you guys probably know, BMPs are not compressed, they're just straight data saved uh, in, in a file format. If you encrypt each value individually uh, with, with ECB mode, you're going to see that same pattern. So if you, you know, just as we saw with uh, with, with, the, with the plain text before, if you do it with an image, you know, it prepared for my to uh, encrypt a, for a developer might encrypt this, and, it, and with, with ECB mode, and they think it's okay, they're, they're encrypting it, they think it's okay. But once you actually encrypt it, you see something like this. Obviously, that's not providing any security. You know, if that's a secret message, and you're using ECB mode to encrypt it, you see a bunch of junk garbage coming out, out of it, but you're not, uh, it's, it's very easily recoverable. You can see the pattern clear as day. Um, the, you know, the, the developer thinks they're secure. You take two minute look at it, and, and, and you can break that encryption. Or actually bypass that encryption. Because the encryption's still there, it's just a matter of uh, seeing the pattern, you know, and, and kind of exploiting the units of what, what they did wrong. So in this case, they should be using C CBC mode or something like that to, uh, so that each, each block is kind of random based on the last block. All right, so that's, uh, that's ECB mode. Uh, that, I mean, that's pretty obvious. That's pretty plain as day. That's, that's a problem. Now we're going to move to, uh, let's see. Uh, oh, and uh, it, you know, you know let's, the, there's other attacks with ECB mode. That wasn't all of them, but you can also move blocks around. You can uh, kind of align the blocks, the block boundaries. There's a, there's a good talk at, at Black at 2012 on that by Thomas Toshek or something, um, which is really interesting about how you can actually decrypt the data if you can control the plain text. Um, and there's also, once you have a good understanding of how these things work, you can just kind of stare at it and think about what the developers might have been doing wrong and then attack it from there. So this isn't a conclusive list, this is a horizontal list, this is just uh, kind of a starter list and, and you really just kind of think about what's the that's going in, what do I have control of, what can I do with it. All right, so for the second part is uh, stream ciphers. So we talked about block ciphers versus stream ciphers, now we're on the stream ciphers. So, uh, as I was kind of saying at the beginning, we XOR each byte with the key string. So at the top there is some, you know, the data you want to encrypt, in the middle is the key string that comes out of the, of the cipher, and then at the bottom is your encrypted data. So it's really simple. You have this magic part where the uh, key string is doing its thing, and, or, and then generating the key string, and then you just have to XOR it. It's really simple, and you get your, your encrypted value. So the actual the actual part, once you ignore that whole algorithm, is, is really simple there. Uh, one really key thing, probably with all algorithms, but especially especially stream ciphers, is to never repeat your initialization vectors. And you, if you've cracked web, or have heard about cracking web, or don't use web, that's because they uh, have the, web has the weakness that it sometimes repeats initialization vectors, so using the RC4, I think. Uh, so this is the exact attack you're doing. This is exactly what happens. You're 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 uh, you're exploiting the weaknesses that we're about to talk about. 
Um, when you have a repeated anesthetization back there, so you control plane text, it's, it's pretty much or it is game over at that point. So when you have, when you actually, when you XOR, uh, when you, when you uh, encrypt the name twice with RC4 with the same IV, the same value back there. So with, uh, here's an example showing that. Well, if you encrypt a set case CU with RC4, you just use that argument, you get, uh, use the command line, uh, you, uh, you get those random bytes there. And if you encrypt it again, you get set case back out. So this is an interesting property that's uh, useful in a lot of attacks. Key streams are really fast, people use them a lot just because, or because they're fast, uh, but they have a lot of weaknesses in them, so they're, um, they can be exploited. So you have to know what you're doing if you're using a stream or any sort of new part for that matter. So one uh, one way that this is uh, important is if you have a URL like that and you have a account ID, you see some encrypted value, you're trying to decide if you can break this thing, you're looking at it and saying, okay, that's the account ID, I don't know what that means, um, okay, let's, uh, let's modify it. Uh, okay, nothing's happening, I'm not in any other people's accounts. Uh, I play with a bunch of values there, nothing's happening, okay. Um, oops, let's go back there. Sorry. Uh, so then you look back and say, during a login, you have this account ID, you, you, your, 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 your uh, account ID, your account goes in the URL there. And then you get this encrypted, you get that same value back. So you try, you know, well, maybe I can tamper with that account ID. And you try changing this 7 to a 8 or something like that, and, and you don't get access to any other account. So, okay, they're checking it there. Uh, then you, uh, so you think, okay, well, uh, okay, what, what's, what's going on there? What could they be doing? Uh, it's obviously being encrypted. Um, you look at that, it's, it's a 7. Seven bytes of encrypted values can come in there. Uh, so you think, okay, get this. Yeah. So, uh, then you think, okay, what else could they be doing wrong there? You know, what else? What other mistakes do they have made? So you log in with another account. Other account during login. They give you uh, two accounts if you're doing a pen test, or you have two accounts if you're not doing a pen test, and uh, you log in with this other account. And you get this other set of text there. And say, okay, well, let's take a closer look at those and, and see what those uh, what those two values are, are, are doing there and what they might mean. So you have those two accounts. They both log in. Oh, look, they have two, two numbers in the comment, and they both give you the same account. Two of the bytes are the same. So, okay, you think, okay, it's seven bytes. That doesn't make sense to the block cipher because they're always like eight or 16 digits at hexadecimal. Uh, and, uh, Bytes, I guess. And then the account ID is also giving uh, when when the second digit is one and the fourth digit is uh, four, get the same output. So think, okay, well they're doing extreme cipher and they're screwing something out, but they're not they're using the same same initialization vector because same input, same output. Okay, I can this. So from there, you can just, based on kind of the properties of, the, of a stream cipher, you can uh, XOR it. We can take our original account ID and XOR it and get the key stream material. So that's kind of like the, the keys to the kingdom. You can kind of do whatever you want from that point. Um, so we have the values that are being used in every account ID at that point. Or at least, at least you think so at that point. That's what you're attempting. Uh, And so we have the key stream, so now we can generate our own account IDs. Let's try just starting at one. Let's, uh, let's put that in the decimal and uh, answer it and get, the, get a new account ID back. Let's encrypt our own. And we get this ID. And you put that in your request, see what happens, and you get in. So this is, uh, I mean, this is everywhere. Not, 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 not in every application, but you can find this in the wild. There's thousands of applications that have this unfound right now. Um, same with the ECP stuff. 
it's, it's, it's all over the place. People just think, oh, RC4, it's uh, something I've heard of, it's probably secure. Let's use that. And another thing that we won't get into is you can decrypt uh, other values by, by XORing the ciphertext value and by XORing your same uh, context value. It's kind of a cumulative property of XOR or TANSIP or something like that. Uh, but basically you can uh, get, get your, uh, get decrypt other values that you, that, you didn't, that you don't even have any access to. So if you, if you, if you get the encrypted value, you can actually decrypt those once you, once you know the information we just discussed. Um, there's a reference there at the bottom, which is really good. There's kind of, that's the title of it. I'll have a graphic slide at the end if you want to kind of walk through that, kind of walk through the actual operator to see what they how to do it. All right, so that was uh, RC4. We've been through ECB and RC4. Now we're moving on to SSL attacks. So I was originally just going to kind of focus in on those two attacks. But then, I think after I signed up for this talk, the, yeah, it was. Uh, I was uh, actually, actually in Europe at the time. Um, the, I came back and uh, there was this breach attack that happened at Death at uh, BlockAdden.com, one of the two. I think it was BlockAdden. And it was released. So I was like, okay, that's cool. That's relevant. This just came out. Let's, uh, let's talk about that a little bit. So I, I kind of dove into that and, and learned a lot of interesting things about it. Um, so there's been a lot of attacks on SSL and TLS, uh, which you probably heard of, seen links to, uh, read about. Uh, in kind of chronological order here, there's somewhat chronological order. There's SSL renegotiation, which uh, which a, a guy here from Kansas City discovered at a level of heart, which is a pretty big deal. I got my own one up. Hang out. This is kind of a design weakness in the, in the, in the protocol. Um, in the, uh, uh, in kind of a, a weakness in the RFC itself, with it, uh, from, from, from what I understand, it's probably correcting me on there. <laughs> the, um, then there is Ju Juliana Rizzo and. They, uh, they, they discovered Beast and Prime. These, these are two different attacks on, on SSL. Beast is a, a chosen plain text attack across packets used PCB. It's kind of complex. It was really something that somebody thought about 10 years ago. They went through some academic papers, read about it, and thought, okay, let's figure out how to implement that. And they did, and they got working in it, and they wrote SSL. Uh, Prime is another uh, another attack on, on SSL. Uh, prime time and breach, well I guess all these attacks on SSL. Prime time and breach are all compression attacks, so we'll get into what that means here in a minute. Um, they are, uh, so, so, so prime is on HTTP requests uh, that use SSL. Time is a attack on responses that uses, uh, it's a timing attack and Breach is an attack that's very similar to Chrome or to time, uh, using packet size instead of timing itself. Uh, we'll get into those a lot more, especially Breach here in a minute. Uh, Lucky 13 is, is a padding oracle using a timing attack for RC4 biases and TLS. When you use RC4, the first 257 bytes are entered the random, so you're not supposed to use them, and they did. Uh, so, just a little, little bit of information about that. I don't, I don't understand that attack fully. So, Breach, the, the history of this is really interesting. I, I didn't realize this when I got into it. I was uh, thinking, okay, new attack. This is uh, brand new. I'm, I'm going to learn something. Uh, it, it's kind of, it's just cutting edge here. And uh, the interesting thing was, is, as I dug into it and learned more, Breach was actually discovered really in, in, in by, uh, with, with the release of, of the crime attack, that, that whole compression attack. They mentioned it in their slides as kind of a thought, and uh, nobody really did anything with it, nobody really talked about it or exploited it. Probably those guys that released it and a few other people kind of knew was sitting there, but nobody really did anything with it. So it's kind of lurking. I feel like as a security community, we kind of almost missed this one. Uh, but at the same time, we, uh, you know, it was good that the breach people brought this to our attention, but it was kind of introduced as a brand new attack. And really, it was taking somebody else's 
and scroll through two thirds of the way through somebody else's slides and, and then make that into a presentation. So with, with little attribution. So I'm kind of confused about the history of it. Um, it was really, they got their own website, it was really good looking and everything, so it got quite a bit of press. Um, but it was just kind of interesting. Time Attack uh, was actually before Breach at Black Hat EU, and it was, it's really similar to Breach, but they didn't release a website, they didn't release any proof of concept stuff. I don't, I don't know why, but it didn't get much press. It's really cool, Attack is also. Um, it's a. Uh, applies more commonly, but is not as effective. Um, so time is cool too, it's, it's really similar. I, I heard about Breach all over, but I didn't hear about time at all. Um, so it was kind of interesting. I really didn't hear anything was about uh, that Breach was kind of part of crime at the time. So I was kind of surprised to learn that it was really uh, kind of previous work, kind of scroll through the white paper and read some of the sentences to get, find any attribution there. All right, so we're going to get in this breach attack here that was uh, released this year, or uh, I guess kind of publicized this year from the previous slide. So with GZIP compression, if you, if you, as you can imagine with uh, compression, if you've ever thought about how it might work or seen how it works, any repeated values are compressed. So if you, I went through and did encrypted or uh, compressed all those values, set KC, and then my guess equals nothing, it was S, it was S E, it was S E B, it was S C. Different values there. Some guesses are right, some guesses wrong. We looked at the number of bytes that they resulted. So this is pretty clear. If you repeat the same kind of string there, you're gonna get a, a, a smaller number because it's able to compress it. So, so if you use uh, set KC completely twice, it's not gonna take you, it's, it's gonna be able to compress rather than if you use my guess equals ASDF or something like that. It's, it would actually not be able to compress that. So as part of uh, um, as part of that, so that's I mean that's, that's pretty obvious compression stuff. Uh, which is which is kind of why I'm surprised this this lurked in SSL for so long. It's really not an SSL weakness; it's, not, it's an HTTP weakness. It's just kind of a fundamental weakness on it. It's using SSL uh, in, a, in a situation that it really shouldn't be used for. I guess. Yeah, the plans there at the bottom if you want to try that at home. Uh, the uh, so then, so, so, so SSL is obviously encrypted. Uh, so if you compress, uh, then encrypt, you get kind of the same result. Repeated values equal smaller, smaller, uh, smaller output. So, so you might think, okay, well, why don't we encrypt and compress? Well, the answer is, you're not going to get any compression if you just have random data. You're getting compression because you have repeated values. You have lots of white space. It's all packing it down. You need to have 100 kilobyte response. It's packing it down to 20 kilobytes because you have new lines of white space and values that are, that are uh, commonly repeated. And you can compress it down. So HTTP compression, which is used in a lot of HTTP responses, compresses and encrypts. It's basically pointless uh, to uh, encrypt and compress. So you can still see those encrypted values if you can control what's being input there. You can see if you can only control my guess, you know, what's to the right there. You can see what uh, um, you know if, if your guess might have been right because because you, you don't know the secret. You can only control the my guess part, and by looking at just the output, you can see whether your guess is right or not. It's pretty cool. Uh, so at the, uh, the bottom of the command again, if you want to mess with that. So the limitations on breach itself are that it needs HTTP compression. This is a compression attack. All these compression attacks rely on compression. So Prime relied on TLS compression. Kind of everybody disabled or is paying attention disabled for TLS compression. Uh, breach relies on HTTP compression. I, I checked a few of the common most common websites and I went through about two in my head before I found one that HTTP compression enabled. I didn't check, uh, I didn't exploit this on a, on a real website. Um, I just kind of checked to see if compression was enabled and then I worked on the exploit uh, and, I, and I haven't uh, done anything with it yet. Of course that's what I'd say anyway if I had. Uh, 
So, it, you can only recover, since that's, a, that's the compression, you can only recover what's being compressed there. So that's, that's HTTP compression is only on the responses on the can be request. So that's, uh, that's, that's the only way to apply it there. So attack diagram for, for each is, is, is this. So the black, of course, is the, the attacker. Um, so if you can get uh, kind of man, man in the middle of SSL, they, they, and, and just let it pass through. Don't, don't, don't take it and decrypt it. Just uh, don't, don't intercept it. Just have to be given your own. Just let it pass through in half number of bytes. So you, you are a man in the middle without, uh, without uh, breaking SSL. And then you can you can get them to visit your page. So you're getting your custom responses. You 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 met something. You link them to something on Facebook or whatever. However, however you want to do it. I guess if you're in a man, you just inject it in the old chat, and, it, and it'll work there. So you set this up, and it's communicating with some web server right there. Uh, that's uh, that's basically how breach works. So if you so kind of further explain the kind of theoretical part of the attack. So you uh, you control any sort of web page. You get them to uh, visit visit it, and then you issue tons of requests. Your web page tells uh, their their computer to issue tons of requests to the bank.com or whatever whatever that server is. And by looking at the response items, you can tell what uh, what the what the value is, what the, what what's, what's encrypted there. So. Right there, you're, 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 you're basically, I'd say breaking SSL, but you're, you're really just bypassing it. You're, you're, you're exploiting the weakness, they, they use HTTP compression, and, and you're able to bypass it there. All right, demo time. This works. So I spend a ton of time writing this tool to uh, exploit breach. Let me get this stuff on that screen so you can see it. This will be rough. All right, so this is all the data there. Just make sure it works here. All right, so we have a TCP relay that doesn't intercept SL, it just counts the bytes. We have a, uh, a server that responds to the client saying, go visit the site, go request this, go request A, go request B. I'm looking at the, the TCP relay, looking at the, uh, looking at the bytes come back, trying, trying to infer what uh, um, this, uh, this breach master is also telling the client what value to request next and tracking everything. Yep. Did you write that tool or is that part of it? I did. I, I, yeah, I, I don't think there's any, uh, I couldn't find any breach exploits, but I plan on releasing this. So there, so the breach guys should release proof of concept code for breach. This sucks, but oh well. It's, uh, it's, it's ASP.NET, it, it works. It's like you have to run this client server, it just communicates back with each other. This is actual in the browser, it's working. I, I, I mean, I wrote the website, of course, because I'm, you know, it's not gonna, I wrote the codes because you know, I'm not just going to have it work on Facebook or something and release it. But, uh, so I wrote this and it's actually working in the browser, which is, which is really the hard part. Um, getting, getting everything working, communicating back and forth, tracking which uh, requests and responses are going, tracking the TCP uh, byte count, and then going back and forth. So I plan on releasing this. The, code, the code's nasty, I'll admit. I, I don't, I'm not comfortable releasing it yet. Just, it's just, I, I, I just got it working, and I need to clean it up, reading things, and read comments and stuff like that. Can you uh, full screen it? So, I don't know what the projector did, but it, uh, when the white background came on, it kind of like messed up. Okay, well, all right, so we got our, wait, uh, I'm gonna change windows here. So we got our we got our TCP relay running this kind of device. We got our breach master, which is which is the web server. It's the uh, the evil web server, and also the bank.com because I'm not going to sit here and attack the live uh, site on video. All right, so I'm going to refresh the. Uh, let's see. So if you, uh, it's going to be difficult. Uh, so if we go to bank.com, we got a trusted server, it's SSL, 
this tab and see that crime pays. The, uh, this is some secret value that only this side can see. You know, it, different tabs should be able to see other tabs data. You know, this is a fundamental, fundamental property, the same origin policy, SSL. You should not be, a, if you're a different site, you should not be able to read this. All right, so we're gonna re refresh this page here and, uh, and you can see what happens. Uh, you know, it's, it's gonna run. It's gonna go quick. We got a lot of debug off, it's still on. That's the, uh, that's the client side, that's the server side. Should I full screen that? Yeah. All right, so. Oh, we lost my scroll bar. Is that heavy? Well, let's. let's uh, I'm having trouble reading that. So if you look here, hopefully it's still running and it's just not scrolling. Uh, the byte counts, I'm requesting every byte, A, B, C, this might be scrolled up, either way it still works. Uh, it, so look, C, we, we know because of the, the tab, the secret value is uh, crying pays, but C is 254 bytes. Every other request is 200, I'm sorry, 294 bytes. Every other request is 295 bytes. So it's going to continue and go on through and, uh, and and count the number of bytes for each request and response. Obviously, this is going all going through SSL. It's a real cert. Uh, but we can see this one is probably the right answer. Let me see if I can recover this. So the weakness is because it doesn't chain, you'll be able to group, just group through that, right? Is there a scroll bar over there? There we go. Yeah. So the weakness is that the value doesn't change. Is that your question? Go full screen again. Is that your question, Bill? The weakness is that the value. The question is because it's not chaining. Yeah. You're able to go through it, right? Yeah. And if, if, if the encrypted value was, uh, I mean, if it was. I did it again when you full screen that. Oh, full screen kills the scroll. Alright. We're not going to full screen. If you pull it just a hair off the screen, it might scroll. What's that? If you pull it just a little bit to the left, it'll look like it did it. Like, pull it off the screen just a hair. Can you guys see that? That is. Can you guys see that? A little bit, maybe? All right, so, I mean, it's really not important as long as you can see that it's decrypting the, uh, it's, it's bypassing SSL and decrypting the value in the other tab. Uh, we have Prime so far solved here. It could work faster. I just put in a lot of uh, timing breaks because of various conditions. I was, I was just lazy in writing the files and opening up files and stuff. That TCP really has two separate programs. I should really do one but clean code. To, to, to kind of hand out everything off. So I just put in like uh, delays there. So that it, should, it should be done by now. Uh, but uh, but so far we're, we're through Prime. You can see that it's, uh, it's decrypting the values there. Um, pretty cool stuff. Not too often you get a chance to just completely you know, bypass SSL. It's, I mean, I call it breaking SSL, but it's uh, SSL is fine. It's the HTTP compression of SSL is probably good. So now that you kind of understand breach, hopefully, and it's a compression attack, the time was basically the same thing with Black Hat AU, where it was, uh, instead of man in the middle of SSL uh, to count the byte size, it was just measuring the amount of time with, with JavaScript. So it would say, it would send out the packet, see how long it took to come back. If it was 300 milliseconds, it would say it was one packet. If it was 30 milliseconds, it would say it was two or something like that. And then, uh, and then eventually the same thing. The cool thing is, if you do this remotely, you're going to attack somebody in um, Olathe. And uh, that's not on your network. And uh, 
Sorry. Any evil country where I thought I couldn't. So you can you can uh, decrypt uh, other people's values you know, all around the world just using that by getting the time attack right. So they didn't implement the uh, time attack, but I plan on implementing that as the extension of breach. The breach getting breach solid, getting the code clean will be good. Start and then and then working on time would be a good second step. So um, being able to, I mean, this is all over the place. Nobody's really fixing it. I don't, I don't know. I haven't seen it much. So this, this would be cool too. Um, it's important this stuff gets fixed. Uh, by disabling HTTP compression, uh, this would be fixed. There's a number of other ways to check out uh, our references and the references. Uh, the uh, different slides here, there's breachattack.com that has uh, different information about other mitigation strategies. Honestly, I was, I was really just worried about breaking this thing and not about not fixing it. Um, so you can, you can check that out to, uh, if you want to learn more about how to mitigate it. I think disabling HD expressions is a fair one. They have some uh, kind of bad ideas about randomizing the amount of response size and stuff, which isn't going to work because you can always just take more samples and it's kind of like that element of randomness there. But uh, it's, 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 it's worth checking out. Um, the, all these links, actually, the ISEC partners, they have an excellent, excellent overview on all of these attacks on SSL. Which was completely unnoticed by everybody that I've talked to. Uh, is, a, is a good read. It's, it's, you know, it's, in my opinion, it's kind of more important to breach. You got a thousand times less press just because you didn't get through one website or something. I don't know. It's in EU, EU, it's in the US. Uh, and, uh, and the breach references are also also good. It's, it's good information. And, and also uh, the RC format, I think that I mentioned, uh, back long slides. I think those are all all good references that I would recommend if you want to learn about this. Do you guys have any questions about anything? All right, thank you.